Okay, so this video is uh, going to run through the topic of intermolecular forces. Um, it's a topic from Unit 1 or Chem 1 on the AS specification, so for AQA. Um, it comes as part of the bonding topic. Um, there is a shapes molecules video. This one's going to purely just look at intermolecular forces, uh, what they are, how they work within molecules. Uh, and then it's going to end up looking at some uh, some exam questions as to kind of how you can apply your understanding um, in an exam situation. So first off, uh, intermolecular forces. So kind of really, what does this term intermolecular forces or intermolecular force actually mean? Well, with anything, if you can break the term down, you can work out what is actually what it means. Then sort of you're halfway there. You've you've almost won the battle. So intermolecular forces. The term inter um, that actually is talking about between so between and the places you might see that so an intercity train is a train that travels between cities not within it's a between and that's very very important here term molecular is really kind of fairly self-explanatory we're talking just really molecules with reference to a molecule so these are forces then that are acting between molecules not within the within force um, within molecule force uh, within molecular force I should say are things like your covalent bonding your ionic bonding and your uh, your metallic bonding we are talking about the forces that are actually made between the molecules and I can't stress that enough really really can't so um, what are these forces then? Well there's three at AS that you need to know um, and it's important that you certainly do know what these forces actually are, you know the name of them uh, and I'm going to start off with what the name of the names of them are uh, before going into detail about each one uh, and as I said then ending up with some exam questions sort of pulling together all of the ideas. So the forces are uh, we have Van der Waals forces uh, you can call them VDW, an abbreviation we have uh, dipole dipole and we have hydrogen bonding so they are our three forces there are some different names for these forces you could stick the term permanent in front of our dipole dipole here uh, and these could be classed as induced dipole dipole um, but I'm going to stick with Van der Waals, dipole dipole, just as a general term there, as a separate one, and uh, hydrogen bonding there as, as a different one. Um, there again, if you look through a mark scheme, you'll see there are all sorts of other names as well. Uh, I'm not going to go through those other names. These are the terms I'm going to use. Um, these are the terms I'm happy with, and that I think you know they work fine. If you can stick with these in an exam, you're absolutely, you're absolutely laughing. Uh, the important bit here, oh, not the straightest line in the world. The important thing here is that these forces are are not equal, um, particularly in the way that they work within a molecule, and particularly the strength of the forces, the force strength is not equal. We find that, and I've done this in, a, in order like this for, um, on purpose, starting here at Van der Waals forces, this is our weakest force, and this up here is our strongest force. Now note, these are not as strong, even at hydrogen bond here, they're not as strong as our proper bonds. Well, these are intermolecular forces, they are much weaker. They have an effect, they have a huge effect, and stuff that you'll have done, that you do all throughout um, the A-level, and at GCSE and, you know, Key Stage 3 and all the rest, they have an effect, they're very important, but they are not as strong as the proper bonds, if you like, so ionic covalent and the metallic bonds. Right, so... That's generally kind of a bit about intermolecular forces and the three forces, particularly the strength that we're talking here, that's very, very important. I'm going to go through these now in order, breaking them down into sort of more how they work and looking in a little bit more detail about them, giving some examples and all the rest. Starting then with uh, Van der Waals forces. So, Van der Waals forces, let's see what colour I want to use. Let's go with that one. So, Van der Waals. So this is the weakest intermolecular force, as you saw from the previous slide. So these are the weakest that you're going to deal with in uh, in the AS uh, Unit 1. What actually are they? Well, Van der Waals forces exist in all molecules. Okay, that's that's the key thing. They exist in all molecules. They're the weakest intermolecular force, but they are there in all molecules, whereas the other two aren't necessarily going to be there. 
the way they work is that if you imagine you have a molecule and we'll imagine let's just say we've got uh, let's just say we've got iodine we'll stick with iodine so the iodine molecule i2 that is made of an iodine atom bonded to another iodine atom via covalent bonds now if we were to think about actually kind of what we find we are we've got here is that around these atoms within this molecule we have electrons so there are electrons within the molecule and these electrons are constantly moving they're not static they don't sit in these delightful little orbitals um, just sitting there waiting for reactions to take place they are they are um, they are moving they are active and they're going all over the place but the key thing is at any one point there are likely to be electrons more electrons in one place in the molecule than there are in the others. So, for example, if I talk about sort of what, um, electron density, I might find if I were to look around this molecule, maybe I would have something like this. And what I'm implying here is that I have less electrons here and more electrons here. So the electrons have moved within the molecule and I have a greater weight of electrons on this side than this side. And what that does is that creates a an induced dipole. So I can say that this side, because there are less electrons, it's therefore, I guess, delta positive and this side would therefore be delta negative as a result. Now the key thing is these electrons are moving, so no sooner has this become apparent, then it might flip and it might go to the other side where we've got lots here and then a lesser number here and again that switches so this now becomes delta negative and this now becomes delta positive the key thing is in a group when you've got lots of molecules together this random switching is happening all the time so one molecule becomes delta ne negative there and delta positive there which is attracted therefore to this next molecule it's delta negative and delta positive and that's constantly switching around there are constant attractions occurring constantly switching so where there was an attraction then there's not an attraction where there was there's not and all the rest but the overall effect is that this uh, these temporary dipoles cause basically an overall an overall attraction and that's really quite important, that's really quite key. So we have an overall attraction. You don't have to worry too much about sort of the theory behind this, but it kind of helps to explain it and gives you a bit of a bit of a ground in as to sort of what's happening. So the overall switching uh, of where the electrons are within the molecule means that they may therefore be attracted to other molecules due to the uh, opposing opposing charges. So delta positive would be attracted to this delta negative here, which would be attracted to other molecules, delta positive, and all the rest going through this whole huge molecule. And they all switch and they go for it again. The important thing is this force, uh, this van der Waals force, it its strength changes depending on the size of the molecule and ultimately the, the number of electrons that are present. So bigger molecule equals more electrons and this leads to stronger van der Waals forces and the opposite is therefore true a smaller molecule has less electrons therefore has a weaker van der Waals forces and and you can see this particularly if we look at um, a graph of something like the noble gases uh, in particular so these guys here we start with helium which is the smallest going up to radium, sorry, radon, which is the the biggest. Um, and as you can see, um, the size increases. We get more electrons, we get bigger atomic radii and all the rest. And the boiling point and melting points here, each of these lines being representing the boiling and melting point, they increase because the forces get bigger. And all really we're talking about with melting and boiling points is we are separating the forces between the molecules and that's very very important so melting and boiling point is really the f the energy required to separate um, the molecules okay melting we're talking about sort of I guess a partial separation uh, boiling we're looking at a total separation where we are we obviously turn it into a vapor into a gas uh, where the forces between them are, are relatively relatively low but this fits exactly what I've just said bigger molecule or in this case obviously these are atoms but again more electrons therefore stronger van der Waals forces going from small relatively small to relatively big there across or down the group but uh, going from helium there through to radon so that's really quite important this is one way that you could see this and you could certainly be asked an exam to describe this trend and explain this trend 
Um, and all you would need to do is say that as, as we go down the group, from helium through to radon, the size of the atom increases, therefore there's more electrons, therefore there are stronger van der Waals forces, therefore more energy is required to overcome the attraction, to overcome the forces between the atoms. So that's really our, our van der Waals forces, okay? That's our van der Waals forces. Key thing there, and whilst it's important that you have the understanding of the van der Waals, is that actually within all of these, the idea of the melting um, and I'm going to put melting slash boiling points, it's really we're looking at it, the energy required to separate molecules or in terms of obviously what we've done there we, we could also say atoms but it's more like hence it being intermolecular forces it's more likely that you're going to be dealing with molecules rather than atoms uh, last bit on van der Waals before I move on to the dipole dipole stuff um, and this is a case particularly when we look at things like uh, fats are a really good example so straight chain saturated fats versus um, unsaturated fats so saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Uh, this term saturated and unsaturated applies to the bonding that's present in the chains of the fats. I'm not going to go into detail about what the fats look like really. The key thing is saturated they are all single bonds and we end up with sort of chains that look kind of like this and if we were to draw the next one it would sort of be like this and the next one like this. When we look at unsaturated fats we tend to find that the chains have sort of these kinks in them uh, and as a result they tend to sort of be like this or or this also applies to branched chains I guess so here I'm looking at straight chains um, and again van der Waals forces are coming into play here if this is one section of my saturated fat or my straight chain molecule and this is one section of my branch chain or my in this case the unsaturated fat where there's a kink in it note that when we have our straight chains they can lie very closely together and therefore due to this the van der Waals forces are stronger because the chains are lying very close together when we look at the the branched ones, they are not as close to each other and because they're not lying as close to each other here what I find is that my van der Waals forces are actually weaker as a result. So it's not just dependent upon the size of the molecule, it's also dependent upon the branching, how closely they can lay next to each other. In this case branching causes them to be weaker because that really the force is here, less surface area I guess for them to be in contact with and therefore an overall lesser um, lesser uh, less retraction between the between the chains and the, and the molecules, and the proof really is that you'll have seen this um, saturated fats, things like butter, for example, or lard, or coconut oil, or something like that, all tend to be solid at room temperature, okay, or pretty solid at room temperature, and that's because they have a high um, a high proportion of saturated fats within them, and because of this uh, this straight chain which lie close to each other, they therefore requires more energy, and room temperature just doesn't have the energy to actually to overcome those forces, and as a result, the butter and the lard tend to be solid. Unsaturated fats, we're talking our olive oils or general sort of veg oils, uh, and in this case, they tend to be liquid. They contain more unsaturated fats. The van der Waals forces are weaker, therefore the energy provided at room temperature is enough to overcome the forces, and therefore we end up with liquids. If we cooled these down, we would find them solidifying, but the key thing is at room temperature, the comparison between these two is an application and is a, is a way for us to actually see van der Waals forces in action, particularly the straight chain versus the, the branch chain. So that's van der Waals forces. Okay, that's, that's it, all, it all basically done. It's electrons moving around causing an overall attraction and that's, that's basically it. Um, going on to the next one, we'll have a look at permanent uh, dipoles. So Permanent dipoles, what are these? Well, the van der Waals, I mentioned the, the term, the idea of temporary or induced dipoles due to those, uh, those movement of electrons. Well, here we have, well, not temporary, it, it's permanent, obviously, it's, it's in the name. Uh, it's permanent dipole, dipole. So we're looking at situations where that delta negative, delta positive is always present. And the classic one here is something like a hydrogen halide. So I'll go for hydrogen uh, chloride 
right there, and there's my hydrogen chloride. And what I get there is if we look at that in a bit closer, then I'll change colour, I really like that colour. Um, hydrogen is here, and my chlorine is here. Due to the electronegativity difference between these, I know, or hopefully, that the electrons are going to lie closer to the chlorine in this double in sorry in this single bond here my single covalent bond because chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen therefore they lie closer to here now that's not going to change that's the general sort of pattern there we're looking at that it being how it is generally in the bond in terms of the effect that has on the molecule this is always there for a delta positive end this is a delta negative end and you'll come across this idea again in um, some of the mechanisms in unit 2 but in terms of the actual intermolecular forces here, delta positive end, delta negative end, because of where the electrons lie. Now if I were to stick another uh, molecule here, I could put a, I'll try and get back to that greeny colour, another hydrogen chloride there, uh, I'll put another hydrogen chloride right there. Again, now what we're getting is when we look at the actual, uh, the individual molecules, when we add more in, we can see where the attraction causes. There's a delta positive, delta positive, delta positive end. This is our delta negative end. And we have attraction. We have attraction here between those molecules. And so it's a very similar idea to the van der Waals, but here we're talking about permanent dipoles um, occurring really there, uh, which, is, which is obviously quite useful. It allows for a uh, stronger attraction than we had with um, the, the van der Waals. So we have stronger forces of attraction. But works in a similar way. It's an attraction between the delta positive and delta negative areas. Okay, Therefore, this, this electrostatic attraction, um, it can be overcome. Again, melting boiling points dependent upon how much energy is required to overcome these uh, the attractions between these, these different ends here. Um, in terms of diagrams in an exam, if you're expected to draw stuff, well, here's your sort of diagram. You could put a little sort of uh, the idea of a, an attraction between these two guys here, um, but that's basically uh, our sort of sort of the simple uh, simple description, really, a simple explanation of this dipole-dipole situation. Okay, final one um, is hydrogen bonding, and hydrogen bonding isn't necessarily any more difficult really there's a little bit more to sort of remember um, but it's the general idea is pretty it's pretty similar um, to the last two it's certainly we're talking about attractions between opposites and all the rest now hydrogen bonding occurs and it's no it's got this name bonding it is still an intermolecular force it is the strongest of the three um, and it crops up all over the place. It crops up in biology. It's between the base pairs in, in the DNA helix, um, which we know can be broken because we can separate it and we can carry out DNA replication and all the rest. But hydrogen bonding has quite a key effect um, and comes up certainly in A2 as well as AS. Uh, and the questions are all very, very roughly the same. And it basically revolves around the idea of a molecule containing oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. And these must be bound to... Um, bonded to hydrogen. So as the name implies, hydrogen bonding, we are dealing with some hydrogen present here somewhere. The example that you're, or the, one of the classic examples is in water, where if I was to draw a water molecule here, here's my hydrogen, here's my oxygen, and here's my other hydrogen, H2O, water. Now, Note the water molecule itself has covalent bonds within the molecule, but we're looking about between water molecules. So I'll stick another, wa another water molecule down here. Uh, and then I'll go for um, a another water molecule. Let's put one here. Not really the greatest positioning, but there we go. So there's my water molecules, done. Now, the key thing is, on these water molecules, I have um, some lone pairs. And it's those lone pairs that are very, very important. And each oxygen has two of them. So there's my lone pairs, two lone pairs on each one of my oxygen atoms. Hydrogens have no lone pairs, that's fine. But what's important, if I deal with one water molecule to start with, is that oxygen is electronegative. Okay, well that's not how you spell electronegative. 
Let's try that again. Oxygen is electronegative. Much better. Um, hydrogen isn't, and therefore we have a difference. We have a polar bond between the two here, where we have the electrons in here much closer to the oxygen, creating a delta positive region and a delta negative region. And what we actually find in, it's sort of in reality here is that, so this is our delta positive, delta positive, delta positive, delta positive, oh, this is tiring, delta positive, delta positive. The, it is the lone pairs of electrons really that create this sort of delta negative region um, and, and are what really are quite important in this, um, in this uh, process of hydrogen bonding. So we have water molecules here. We have a delta positive region uh, in my hydrogen and I have this delta negative region here and I particularly have these lone pairs. What we get is we get an attraction between the delta positive hydrogen and the lone pairs of other molecules. And that is a hydrogen bond right there. It's the attraction between the hydrogen and the lone pair on the oxygen, on the nitrogen or on the fluorine. That's the important thing. All three of these have lone pairs on them and with the bonding with the hydrogen present as well, when we throw in other molecules, we will have this attraction between the hydrogen and the oxygen. This comes up in an exam, in exam situations, and we'll so, show you later on. And you'll see the uh, the kind of things that you are uh, you are shown, um, the kind of things that you see in terms of the question. Uh, well, they will expect you to draw something like this. It's very important that you include partial charges. It's very important that you include the lone pairs as well, um, regardless of which example we're talking of. It's probably going to be water, to be honest, that they're going to use in an exam. But they could use any molecule. It's about applying your understanding to it. Um, so that really is 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 hydrogen bonding. If we were to have a different example, and you might say, well, what about if it was something like, uh, we use fluorine, so hydrogen fluoride. Same concept here, fluorine, very electronegative, and here we would have the electrons much closer to the fluorine end. And so we end up with uh, lone pairs on the fluorine. Again, lone pairs, but that attraction occurring between the two between the hydrogen and the fluorine's lone pairs there and we could keep going and we could have a molecule we could have a, a big web set up but it's the same concept again we could do it with ammonia we could do it with all sorts of different molecules which is no point doing it again and again it's the same concept lone pairs with hydrogens attraction between them boom you've got yourself uh, a couple of easy marks there in terms of application for this, where might you see, what, where might the questions go? Well, sometimes there are questions relating to uh, water um, and hydrogen bonding, particularly in relation to ice. Uh, but if you've ever seen an iceberg, icebergs float. Okay, icebergs tend to not really sink very well. They tend to sit on above water. Uh, when a, in winter, when a pond freezes, the the top of the pond freezes, water essentially the ice is is less dense. It doesn't sink. It's less dense than the water. Which is very important because in terms of life and things, the the ice floating to the top means that life underneath actually ends up, uh, the water underneath is a little bit warmer as a result, it kind of traps some of that heat in and actually life can still fry, thrive under under that icy icy layer. But the reason for that is that it's all down to really the hydrogen bonding. So when we have ice, we tend to find that in a, in a solid form, so in ice, more hydrogen bonding or more hydrogen bonds and what it have is these, these hydrogen bonds particularly in the water tend to have a very set length and we end up forming a really regular lattice um, of, of water molecules in, in ice and as a result uh, it actually the the volume of the water increases so the water expands when it freezes because this regular arrangement becomes set up where the water molecules are actually now further apart than they were within the liquid form and because of that they become less dense but it expands and the one way to see this if you get a uh, a bottle of water fill it right to the top screw the lid on put it in the freezer maybe put it in a plastic bag as well uh, once it's frozen you'll find that often it will it will burst somehow the top of the water will, will come off and all the rest because actually it's expanded um, and and basically split the bottle or force the lid off uh, and it's because of this idea of hydrogen bonding there are more hydrogen bonds in the solid form of water ice um, and those hydrogen bonds lead to a really regular arrangement uh, which looks something like this where we have the water molecules set out in this really regular arrangement lots of space between them therefore lower density than the liquid form of, uh, of water uh, and so it floats uh, and we get this expanded volume 
those that really there actually one more I'll show you what they'll do one more one more diagram which is quite a good one which uh, highlights a couple of the points uh, this graph shows uh, it shows you a couple of um, sort of trends that you can see this first one is the trend down group seven here so fluorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine the next one is the trend down group uh, six I forgot what it was then down group six going from oxygen sulfur selenium uh, to tellurium uh, what we've got here is we've got each of those elements in the respective group seven here or group six here bonded to a hydrogen now remember what I said hydrogen bonding involved either oxygen nitrogen or fluorine and straight away we can see how much an effect it has here's our boiling points both of these exhibit hydrogen bonding they are so much higher than the other examples here so so much higher when we drop down to no hydrogen bonding it goes right down okay big difference between there you know 100 sort of celsius degree difference there between boiling point booms down then notice that it increases well this goes back now to the van der Waals so in all of these cases van der Waals is increasing due to the size of the molecule increasing so we've got a couple of things we can see here bam straight away hydrogen bonding really high boiling point in comparison dropping down no hydrogen bonding but increasing due to the van der Waals and this is quite a nice example here where it's application and description really of, of graphs explanation of this graph due to what you hopefully now know about hydrogen bonding uh, and the van der Waals as well right what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hopefully apply some of those ideas to the uh, to some exam questions uh, and show you the kind of things that come up uh, and actually the repetition that's often seen Okay, so we're going to look at some questions now. Um, I actually just went through and did all these. Um, there's five papers I'm going to go through, and, and so five five questions. I actually went through and did all these. Um, I had the video on pause, so I'll do them again, and hopefully the video is actually recording this time. Um, but I'm, I'm sure we'll see in a minute. So for the second time, although you, you haven't seen it for the second time, um, this question here was it's uh, from June 2010. So I've just picked five random papers really and looked through. You're almost guaranteed in every single paper to get a question that um, relates to intermolecular forces. So this one here, uh, very not very much on intermolecular forces, but this one says about this molecule CCl2F2. So suggest the strongest type of intermolecular force between CCl2F2 molecules. So my advice would be draw that molecule out. You don't want to miss anything. You don't want to get stuff wrong. Um, it takes a couple of seconds to draw it out and at least then you can look at it and you can really visualize what's happening so my molecule what have I got have I got van der Waals well yes because I've got electrons so tick for van der Waals we know that's our weakest though have I got dipole dipole forces and have I got H bonding that's the key questions now so have I got hydrogen bond well let's go to have I got dipole dipole well yes I have and the reason is because these guys are very electronegative, chlorine and fluorine, and obviously the other chlorine and the other fluorine. Therefore, electrons are very close to these halogens, and as a result, we find that there is a large difference in electronegativity between carbon and between the chlorine, and between carbon and the the fluorine. Therefore, we do have dipole dipole. And we have these charges as such: delta negative, delta negative, delta negative. Do we have hydrogen bonding? Well, we have some electronegative stuff particularly the fluorine here which is part of oxygen, nitrogen and fluorine but we have no hydrogen so clearly not strongest one therefore is going to be the dipole dipole forces excellent one mark we are doing good okay next one um, this one is from Jan 12 as you can see at the bottom there um, and yeah this one here starts here so 1D Set the strongest type of intermolecular force between hydrogen and fluoride molecules. Well, that was one of the examples that I gave. So straight away, hydrogen bonding. It has got fluorine in it. It has got hydrogen. Therefore, boom, hydrogen bonding, nice and strong. Here we go. Draw a diagram to show how two molecules of hydrogen fluoride are attracted to each other by the type of intermolecular force that you stated in part D I. Include all partial charges and all lone pairs of electrons in your diagram. Now, I actually did a bit of a bad, did a boo-boo. In, in the previous part of the video where I didn't draw enough lone pairs so please go back and correct that or use this as your standalone version but you must include all lone pairs I did not um, but then I also didn't claim to include them all either so I'm not 
entirely wrong, but also it was a bit bad of me. But anyway, let's go on with this question. So hydrogen fluoride, covalent bond between the hydrogen and the fluorine. Three lone pairs on my fluorine. None on my hydrogen, obviously. Draw my other molecule, because it does specify two molecules. Don't start drawing six, seven, eight, nine, unneeded. Uh, you have a couple of ways of drawing lone pairs. I quite like the double dot one. Do not just do dots like that, because they're very easy to miss. Do them as a bit of a meteor looking uh, couple of dots, or stick that little balloon thing on here as you're doing shapes and molecules. That would be completely adequate as well. Either way, I've got three lone pairs. It asks for partial charges here. So partial charges, well, I've got a delta positive region and I've got a delta negative region. Another delta positive, another delta negative. It does say all partial charges. So don't just do it on one molecule. That's ridiculous. Do it on all of them. The bond itself is formed between the fluorine and the hydrogen. So it's the lone pair of the fluorine and the hydrogen that we get in. Or the lone pair on the ox um, oxygen or nitrogen, whatever. But in this one, obviously, it's got to be the lone pair on the fluorine between the hydrogen. And your three marks for this, I mean, three marks for drawing this much is ridiculous. The mark is for all, I won't even bother like that. It's all partial charges is one mark. All lone pairs is the other, so all four partial charges, all six lone pairs, and for the correct placing of the bond, three marks, bish bash bosh. Um, I like this question, this is a comparison question here, it's quite a clever one, I've lost the pen there is. Um, it gives you the boiling points of fluorine and hydrogen fluorine. It asks you, it gives you what they are, and blah blah blah. And then it says, explain in terms of bonding why the boiling point of fluorine is very low. Well, this is a clever one because some people here will start talking about why hydrogen fluoride has such a high one, respectively, or, or um, comparably. Now that's not needed because it's not asking that. It's only asking you about fluorine. So why is fluorine so low? Well, fluorine F2 only has van der Waals forces, nothing else there. Van der Waals are weak, therefore not much energy required to break them. And that really is probably three marks worth almost there, but certainly this one here is, is definitely it's one if not two marks. Um, in this question, though, we are only awarded two marks, so it's going to be one mark for that one, one mark for that one, two marks overall. Lovely job here. So that's not a bad one at all. If you want to look at the mark scheme of things, the Jan 12 paper, uh, that was. Okay, let's go on to our next paper, our next question then. Another very similar kind of question. State the strongest type of interpeccular force holding the water molecules together in the ice crystal. Well, we'd know it's water, so straight away we're going H bonding. We're not scared to write that. Straight away, tick and mark. Next one, state the strongest type again in methane. Well methane, if we draw it out, contains no halogens, contains no real difference in electroactivity between the atoms and the bonds, therefore no dipole dipole. It's got hydrogens, but it's got no oxygen, nitrogen or fluorine. No hydrogen bonding then, or dipole dipole, so it's only van der Waals. Easy mark though that. Really, really easy mark. So, done another one there, another two marks. That was the Jan 11 paper if you want to check out mark schemes and things. Next one, keeping them going. This one is the June 11 paper, uh, and this is one here ex asking for an explanation as to why iodine has a higher melting point than fluorine. Well, break it down. Think about the, the halogen group. Fluorine's at the top, followed by chlorine, followed by bromine, followed by iodine. Down here we have a size increase. Number of electrons also increases and this links into exactly what I said in the previous part of the video more electrons bigger the size stronger the force so say that iodine is bigger than fluorine therefore more electrons and we could go iodine here the I2 it doesn't matter either way the iodine atoms are bigger, therefore the overall molecule is also bigger. So iodine is bigger than fluorine, therefore more electrons, therefore requires iodine, to be specific, iodine requires uh, more energy to overcome, clear here, more energy uh, to overcome van der Waals forces. It's trying to be comparable there, you really are trying to compare iodine to fluorine. 
two marks again the idea of size and then the idea of more energy required final one here and I like this one because it's a slightly different way of asking it this was June 12 um, this time telling you there is no hydrogen bonding between phosphine molecules phosphine if we go up and look at this you can see phosphine here is this pH 3 so there's my phosphine so pH 3 why is there no hydrogen bonding well I have hydrogen but I've got no oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine. But that's not enough to say. That is not an answer. That is not an explanation. There is no oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. What is it about oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine that allow for hydrogen bonding? That's the key thing. So here, between my phosphorus and my hydrogen, obviously I've got three of those bonds. There is not enough of an electronegativity difference between these two to allow for a dipole, a permanent dipole, to be formed. Whereas if this was nitrogen, there would be enough. And that's the key thing. If we have this exact same format here, but NH3 ammonia, there is hydrogen bonding because this is high enough in terms of electronegativity to create a big difference here, ultimately leading us to a dipole. Um, ultimately leading us to, sorry, I said dipole, but I didn't mean dipole. Ultimately leading to a big enough difference to a uh, to give us the uh, the partial charges to allow for the attraction to occur. So, basically, the answer is phosphorus, not very electronegative therefore not a big enough difference in electronegativity between phosphorus and hydrogen one mark there so a few questions there that should hopefully be the topic of intermolecular forces. Um, hopefully that's made some sense to you. If you have any problems, please do let me know, and I'll do my best to try and answer any, any queries. Um, again, hopefully that's been some help, uh, and thank you for watching.